All right, it's really a pleasure to have with us uh, Mikhail Wenzman, visiting us from Penn State. Uh, I have to admit that I was a bit ill-prepared to present Mikhail because I didn't know his uh, list of honors, so I had to cram really badly to get all of them, and I did not succeed. So I'll start with saying that he's a Packard Fellow and a Sloan Fellow, uh, Naval, you received that, the Young Investigating Investigator Award uh, from the Navy. Uh, and numerous prizes, and for a good reason. You see in front of you the pioneer of topological photonics with, with some colleagues, I guess. Yeah, modest. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think he started at it when a postdoc in the Technion uh, in Moti Seger's group, where he realized the Floquet topological photonic uh, state. Um, and uh, went on to bigger and better as a faculty member in Penn State. I had the honor to collaborate with him at least once or twice, uh, particularly through joint works with Nate Linder. And currently also. And currently. And on that, I mean, Mikhail just has a way of making things work. He makes uh, class take photons wherever he wants them. Uh, and likewise, he created this lovely collaboration, <laughs> managed to make it sales through Muri, and I'm honored to be a member of that. Uh, but that's not about, uh, uh, we're not talking about funding. No, it's just, yeah. Uh, From the sacred to the profane. <laughs> yeah, so, so Mikhail has made the uh, uh, topological photonics really a reality and been guiding the field, and the field has increased dramatically, kind of exploded uh, in the recent, in, in the last decade. Uh, I would add to that that uh, Mikhail was a graduate of Princeton, uh, where he overlapped with uh, Dave. And how much information he wants to give about that, uh, <laughs> I'll let him decide. But with that, I'll pass it to you. So it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Gal. It's a really, really nice introduction. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. Um, as I've been telling all of you, I love Caltech. I love being here. And I have a lot of um, good friends among you. Um, and uh, Dave, Dave, you know, was my roommate for three years. It was three years, right? Three years, or was it two years? <laughs> we established last night that um, we have a lot of memories together, some of which I've repressed, I think. It's <laughs> that or I have a bad memory. But one of them that I'll sort of um, humiliate myself about now is that... Um, um, so we stayed in uh, uh, an apartment complex that was two floors, um, and Dave was on the second floor. And uh, I was, uh, I had a, we had a whole bunch of people over. I was very really excited. It was going to be a, a seafood grill. So we got, um, we got shrimp, we got uh, squid, we got, we even got some, saved up and got some lobsters. And we oiled them all up and we threw them, threw them on the grill. And I think you all know Dave as being incredibly composed person. So this is sort of evidence of that. So he uh, he came down to where we were having the grill. The grill was going crazy, smoke coming out. Uh, he, he, and he said, um, he came down, he was like, um, Mikhail, you know, I uh, was hanging all my laundry out uh, and I left my door open. Uh, can, are you grilling seafood now? <laughs> Apparently it got through it just totally, you know, infested all his clothes, he couldn't get the smell out. And then I think as he reminded me, this is one thing I'd repressed, um, that embarrassingly, we did it again. <laughs> kept this door open a little bit, so. And just very composed. Um, do you think you can tell me next time you do this, please first? Um, that was very, so I respect it for that, very cool. Okay, okay. Enough about enough about uh, that. Let's let's go into some physics. So today I'm going to talk about um, topological photonics, in particular in the nonlinear domain. Uh, so uh, a lot of um, what I'm going to talk about flows from the quantum Hall effect. So I'll I'll just give a brief, very brief uh, overview of uh, the quantum Hall effect and what it is. Many of you are familiar with it, uh, but I thought it's a colloquium, so I'll talk about it briefly. And in particular, I'll talk, I'll talk about how quantum Hall physics can appear in the context of photonic devices. 
Um, and then I'll, I'll give uh, an idea. This is a purely uh, theoretical idea at this point um, for how we can overcome a very fundamental trade-off in photonic devices, in particular slow light devices using topological states in a way that can't be done uh, if the system is not topological. So it really has to be uh, topological to overcome this trade-off that I'll describe. Uh, and then I'll talk about the interacting case. So uh, this is mean field interactions. For, for us, we call that nonlinear optics. Um, and uh, in this context, I'll, I'll talk about the quantization of soliton motion in uh, Thalbus pump. And that quantization that we see is both uh, integer quantization and fractional quantization. It's actually uh, a real surprise to us. Uh, and I'm not sure that we've really completely understood its origin. So I'll talk about, I'll show the experiments and then I'll talk about the, um, the state of our understanding of it. Okay, so quantum Hall effect, what, what is it? Well, um, in a standard quantum Hall effect, you have a 2D electron gas. You put an external magnetic field out of the plane. Um, and you put a voltage in the X direction, you measure a current in the Y direction, so you can get the Hall conductance that way. And the amazing thing about the integer quantum Hall effect is that you can measure the conductance um, with extreme pre precision. So, so uh, these days it can be measured to a part in 10 to the 10. And it's such a precise measurement that it's been used to redefine SI units. So that the kilogram is now redefined in terms of this measurement. Um, so it's really unbelievable. And the reason is, is that that Hall conductance is quantized to a fundamental constant of nature. The, the square of the charge on the electron divided by Planck's constant times an integer. Uh, and that integer is uh, now known as the churning of the system. Um, so the Hall effect can be understood in a number of different ways. Uh, two of the more common ones are in terms of edge states that don't backscatter. Uh, and also in terms of the notion of Laughlin or Thales pumping. So, so both of those are going to be relevant to my talk, and so I'll, I'll explain both. Okay, so um, in a very cartoonish way, how can this be understood, at least semi-classically, uh, at the microscopic level? Well, here's the, the blue box is my two-dimensional gas of electrons, uh, non-interacting electrons. Uh, we have an external magnetic field out of the screen, and of course, electrons uh, undergo cyclotron orbits uh, in the presence of a magnetic field. If electron is confined to the edge of the system, then it's not going to be able to complete a cyclotron orbit because it's going to bounce off the edge. But if there's some defect along the way, then according to the skipping orbit picture, it kind of bounces around the defect and it doesn't uh, backscatter. So this is sort of the semi-classical picture. Uh, the wavy picture uh, would be something like this. You have an electron that's moving along the edge and um, that at, at a given frequency, there's a wave packet that travels along. There's no counter propagating state at that same frequency or energy, uh, meaning that uh, it can't backscatter. So regardless of the nature of the defect that you have here, you just have perfect transmission through the system. So that perfect transmission leads to this lack of backscattering, which in turn leads to this uh, sharp quantization of conductance. It's not susceptible to defects. Um, and so, um, uh, this is really compelling in the context of photonic devices, because when we fabricate photonic devices, there's scattering all the time because we can't fabricate perfectly. Um, so this is really a realization uh, that was proposed uh, by uh, Duncan Haldane and Sri Raghu now uh, more than 15 years ago. Um, what they said is that this quantum Hall physics doesn't have to be only for electrons, that it's more of a general wave phenomenon and it could apply to photons in photonic crystals uh, as well. So a photonic crystal, if you're not familiar with it, is basically a, an artificial solid, but for light. So instead of being just atoms arranged in a crystal lattice in which electrons are propagating, it's a, a dielectric periodic pattern. So the dielectric constant is varying periodically in space. So here's a 2D photonic crystal. You can see here, it's just composed of a bunch of posts. And you can see the length scale here is four centimeters. So this is really a macro scale photonic crystal. Uh, this is um, work done in Marin Soyacic's group. Holden and Raghu pointed out that in order to realize this quantum Hall physics and these robust edge states uh, for photons, you would have to have some mechanism to 
break time reversal symmetry. And that's very challenging for photons because it's not like you can just turn on a magnetic field. Photons don't carry any charge, so they don't feel the magnetic field. And so you have to do something else. So this system, uh, this photonic crystal is made out of um, a uh, material with a non-zero over gate constant, a magnetic material, ferrite, yttrium iron garnet, um, also known as YIG. They put in a strong magnetic field that breaks the time reversal symmetry of Maxwell's equations. Uh, and when you diagonalize Maxwell's equations and you get a band structure for this, you see these chiral edge states, these one-way edge states. And he measured these um, and he saw uh, perfect transmission around defects. Um, and he saw the non-reciprocal behavior. And um, this is sort of a clear demonstration of the effect, but it was done at the macro scale, right? So you can see, as I said, the length scale is four centimeters that corresponded to the wavelength of the microwaves that he used. Um, uh, so um, the big deal a few years later was to try and see if it could be done uh, for light for at the optical scale. And so um, that's where we came in. What we did was to fabricate a lattice of waveguides where the waveguides are just like fibers, uh, except they're arranged in a honeycomb lattice. So there's a whole bunch of them all coupled to one another. And each of the waveguides, instead of being just straight fibers, were helices. Um, and that turns out to effectively break time reversal symmetry in the plane, in the transverse plane. Um, and then we got this characteristic band structure of uh, a topological material, a quantum Hall effect, a churn insulator. And what you could see is this band gap with the uh, ungapped edge states, one going one way, one going the other way, separated in space. And so we could actually see uh, these wave packets propagating along. So here's the wave packet coming. It's hitting a corner there. Um, and since a corner is like a defect, you might expect it to backscatter, but it doesn't. It just keeps going. Um, and so if we, we have another one here in which we put a, a defect in there. So there's like a missing site on the edge. And the wave packet just kind of comes along, goes around it, and goes through with that spread. Yes. In, in the electron case, it's going around in half circles, it's bouncing off the walls. Uh -huh. uh, in the photon case, it's something similar is happening with this wave wave guide. It's yeah, exactly. It's a it's a wave packet that's propagating in a lattice. So you you can think of this as kind of a semi-classical picture that's similar to the little bouncy case, bouncy, bouncy ball cartoon. Um, there's a really nice uh, experiment recently by Bo Zhen's uh, group as a collaboration with John Bowers, um, uh, where he takes a planar photonic crystal and modulates it by coming in from the top, modulates it using the intrinsic nonlinearity of the material to basically realize a Floquet uh, system and get these, uh, uh, he, and he claims a, a, a churn insulator there. And this just sort of came out very recently. Um, so, um, uh, so this is the different types of systems. The real holy grail of the field is to have a planar chip, a planar photonic crystal with a big gap and these therefore these one-way edge states. Um, and what I wanna tell you about now is a theoretical proposal for what you could do if you have those. So that's, that's the first part of my talk. So the idea is having a big gap, chiral edge states, why is this special? Why can it be used for photonic devices uh, uniquely? So um, the idea is um, having to do with slow light. And this is work with, with uh, my former student, Jonathan Guglielman. Um, okay, so um, there's been a ton of work on slowing light down on photonic chips. The idea here is just that you can make the light stay on the chip longer. So whatever it is you're trying to do with it, uh, you just do more of. So that could be generating entangled pairs of photons. It could be generating frequency chrome, sort of like what, uh, what Carrie does. Um, it could be making a mode lock laser, a whole bunch of different stuff on a chip. If you have slow light, you can do it more efficiently or just make the whole device smaller. So this is a ton of work on this. Um, and the traditional way of doing it has been that you make a waveguide in a photonic crystal. And of course that's periodic. And so you have a band structure and you have a band edge and the group velocity goes to zero at the band edge and that's where light slows down. But there's, there's basically two problems with this the, uh, that kind of killed the field. The first problem is uh, that 
you have very narrow bandwidth, right? If you want to operate near this band edge where the group velocity goes to zero, you don't have a lot of room to, to work with. So you have to be in that narrow frequency band. Um, possibly even worse is the fact that you have very strong backscattering. So the backscattering goes like one over the square of the group velocity. So that's not really a problem up here, but it's a big problem near the band edge where the group velocity goes to zero. And there you have crazy scattering, you get Anderson localization. Um, so this is actually the motivation for um, uh, the invention of photonic crystals to begin with, was just to observe Anderson localization. This is Sajid John's idea. So he wanted a nice band edge so he could actually observe Anderson localization of light. So this is what happens to a wave packet. So I'm going to compare a, a clean and a dirty system uh, in the case of slow light. So you can see what happens to a wave packet just kind of falls apart uh, in the slow light regime. And that's because it's just very strong backscattering. So the, those are the obstacles, bandwidth and backscatter. And so it seems natural. Okay, let's use a, a train insulator. Let's use one of these topological materials. Doesn't backscatter. Um, well, so there's, a, there's the typical band structure again. Um, that's true, but it's not slow, right? You need a nice big band gap, right? So you have this big band gap. You have a certain delta E here, which is the gap. And you have a certain delta K there. Um, and so it appears the group velocity is very constrained to be roughly that delta E divided by the delta K. Uh, you, could, you could shrink the gap, and then you do have slow light, but then any disorder that you happen to have um, would, would bring the bands together and essentially kill the effect. Right? So as soon as disorder is the size of the gap, the effect is ruined. Um, so this is, the, this is the pitch. This is our proposal for what to do with this thing. Um, what we do is to make the edge state wind around the brown zone many, 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 many times. Uh, here, you're only seeing it go two times, but in principle, you can make it wind 100 times. And so what that does is effect effectively expand K space. So now your groove velocity is this band gap delta E divided by now this bigger K space, which is the number of windings times the size of the brown zone. So now you've killed two birds with one stone because you have uh, the, now this wide bandwidth, the whole delta E, Right, so you're operating over this large bandwidth. You don't have to be at a band edge. Um, and it's a chiralistic. There's no backscattering at all. And this is perfectly single mode wave guy, even though it looks like it's multi-mode, but any given energy is just one mode. That's the idea. Um, so to, to make a few comments about it, uh, sometimes people get the impression that this is some sort of band folding trick, but it has, I assure you, it has nothing to do with band folding. The unit cell is the unit cell. Um, and that's wouldn't have any physical consequences. So I just want to, if you're thinking that, I want to disabuse you of that. It's perfectly single mode, which is really important in optics. And most importantly, it really has to be topological to work. So if this system were not a churn insulator, then you would have the counter propagating bands going the other way. They would, they would just gap out with these. And what would, what would you have? You'd have just a bunch of slow light waveguides sitting next to each other. And uh, it would be totally trivial completely trivial effect. Uh, so it really has to be topological to work. Okay. So the question is, how do you actually engineer this? How do you make it happen? Um, well, um, think of the most naive way that you'd want to slow something down. Imagine you just have a 1D chain. Um, if you want a slower group velocity, just send the hoppings to zero. And so the bandwidth goes to zero and the group velocity goes to zero. But then of course you have a higher density of states, you have more scattering. Um, and so this is completely trivial. So the idea is to do something similar on the surface or on the edge of a churn insulator. So you take the churn insulator, you start decreasing the hoppings judiciously near the edge. If you decrease the hoppings, you know, you just hop less, so you have to slow down. But the, the trick is this, it's that um, since <laughs> the band in a churn insulator uh, the edge band has to cross from one band to the next. It's forced to do that, but you know, that's absolutely rigorously true. It can't just slow down and detach like a 1D band would. But it, at the same time, it has to slow down. So it has to get slower, uh, but it can't detach. And so it has only one recourse, which is to wind many times, right? Now it could wind really crazy, in which case you could have backscattering, but if you choose those hoppings right, then it goes straight across. 
Um, so here's a here's just a numerical calculation of it. So there's the edge at the bottom, and then this is the bulk up here. As we start engineering the edge and changing those hoppings, we can then make it wind many, many times around the ground zone. So we have this slow light over the over wide bandwidth without any maximum. Um, what we're doing is basically just grabbing states from the bulk and putting them on the edge. So you can see that in this animation. So this blue um, dot is an edge state. This is the gap. You're only seeing the top half of the band structure here. Uh, and then this red is um, a bulk state. And so by engineering the hoppings, what you're doing is kind of grabbing that bulk state and bringing it into the gap so you wind many times. So at this point, this is just a theoretical proposal, but given Bose, Bojan's new system, we sort of think we can make this into reality in, in the next few years, we hope. Um, you might be worried that uh, since you're, in, you're going deeper and deeper into the bulk, the mode gets bigger, but actually it doesn't, it stays confined. So this is the wave function here. Um, and this is as a function of the uh, distance into the bulk and energy on the horizontal axis. And you can see the wave functions and any given energy still stay strongly confined. Um, and the way we can, you can think of this in a very hand wavy way is in terms of a Landau level. So for those of you who, um, who uh, have this at the tip of your finger, if you have quantum Hall system Landau gauge, you have the eigenstates are kind of like waveguide channels, right? Um, that, uh, you know, extend forever in one direction and are confined in the other, they're harmonic oscillator modes. Um, imagine just putting a, a gradient, a potential gradient um, in the perpendicular direction to the quote unquote waveguides. Well, um, what that does is just takes these confined Landau levels and puts them at different energies. And so that's kind of a hand wavy explanation of what these states actually are. Um, and those Landau levels are confined. They stay confined because they're detuned from one another, they don't hybridize. Uh, and so you, you, have, you still have this confinement if you didn't have it, then all the nonlinear effects would be uh, dramatically reduced. So this is actually something we realized in retrospect and we were kind of thrilled that this worked out because we thought the whole thing was ruined. Yes? Can you uh, have several layers of each other? And this would probably show the same effect. Can you have what? Several, several layers coupled to each other. So you have a few of them, one on top of the other. Yeah, because you need the light short enough. Yes. Well, it's quite it's quite different from that uh, because the churn number here is actually still one. We haven't touched the bulk. There's only one edge band. Um, so it's just that they're going slow, right? If you have a number of them, then um, you have more channels, which which is something we don't want. Um, and they're not necessarily slow. So in this case, it's still churn one. Uh, first of all, it would be hard to uh, just in terms of integrated photonics, it would be hard to stack them. So you still do want, you don't want to touch the bulk at all. You want the slow group velocity um, and, and, and still churn one. Okay. Yes, yes. If you take a single, just a cut in energy, that band only crosses once. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, so now I'm going to do apples to apples comparison of... Um, the trivial case and the topological case, same group velocity, same amount of disorder, a wave packet propagates along, you can see it makes a big difference. So one day I hope to do the experiment. It's a hard experiment. We gotta get, the, the challenge is making the band gap big. Okay, so that's, that's the theory side of my talk. Now, let me move on to uh, the experimental side and I'm gonna be talking about these quantized nonlinear thalus pumps. This is work of, um, my wonderful student and wonderful former postdoc, uh, Marius Jurgensen and Seba Mukherjee. Seba is now a uh, faculty member at ISC in Bangalore. Uh, okay, so um, we're really interested in the interacting case. Um, there's been a ton of work in this field in the non-interacting case, um, but in some sense that's, in the non-interacting case, we kind of know everything from condensed matter already in a lot of ways. Um, that when it comes to interactions, everything's very different for photons and for electrons uh, because photons and bosons. Um, and so what we look at in our case is the um, gross pitansky equation. This, so this is in the mean field limit, so many bosons per site. Uh, this is the equation of motion basically for the Bose-Hubbard uh, model. 
Um, and we, we want to ask the question, okay, is there new physics that emerges if you combine some uh, topological Hamiltonian, topological in some sense, with interactions? For us, the way we get these interactions in photonics is by just increasing the power and using the chi-3 nonlinearity of the medium that we use. Uh, and this, this term sort of naturally pops out. So again, um, top, some interesting topological Hamiltonian plus interactions. Is there something non-trivial that comes out of that? So we call this topological nonlinear optics. Okay. Um, the first thing I have to tell you about uh, uh, for the stuff that we uh, are gonna discuss is the notion of a soliton. A soliton is a very natural object that comes out of um, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation or gross patevsky equation that I just showed. Uh, it's basically a wave that guides itself through the potential that it generates. So see, this is acting as a potential, but the potential is a function of the wave function itself, right? So it's creating a potential in which it itself is a bound state, which creates the potential, which has it as a bound state in this sort of self-consistent loop. So it guides itself. That's what a solid time is. So it's, pre it's pretty easy to understand. It's just, you know, imagine you have a laser beam with a small aperture, you shoot it out, it diffracts, right? But if you put it in a, a medium with um, the Kerr effect, uh, this chi three nonlinearity, then by self-focusing, what happens is it generates a change in index, which is just like a potential, and it'll self-guide, so it won't diffract. So it'll hang together. Um, and so that's what the, these, this little animation shows. So I'm gonna be talking about spatial soliton. So this is, if it's a temporal soliton, it would be time, the spatial soliton, it's space. Could you say a word about this photograph? Uh, I mean, it's not Mr. Uh, Scott Russell riding along a horse along it. Canal anymore. Oh, what's going right. on? Okay, so yes, I should say something. So um, solitons were first discovered um, by John Scott Russell in the late 19th century, uh, mid, mid to late 19th century in water waves. So water waves that um, are, where the water is deep, I believe, um, are described by a nonlinear Schrodinger equation as well. Uh, and they have these solitons. So you see this wave that kind of propagates forever and doesn't spread out, doesn't disperse. Um, so the, this, these solitons are very generic. They come up um, in all sorts of applications. So, so Cary, for example, is generating these solitons in optics uh, for generating frequency combs uh, every day. Um, they're used in um, passive mode locking. Um, they are, you see them in MEMS, you see them in poly polymer change. So the Jackie Brevy model, um, you see them in ultra cold atoms in many, many different contexts. Um, and so, so this is sort of a, a, a picture of what's going on. So this is the laser beam diffracting as a function of space. Um, and if it's a soliton, it stays confined. And they're, very, they're not kind of, they're just the opposite of these sort of just so objects. They just are generic, they pop out. Um, if you start out a plane wave in this nonlinear Schrodinger gross patevsky system, and you have a little bit of noise, there's an instability where it falls apart and just forms these solitons spontaneously. So in optics, we call this modulation instability. Uh, they just they just appear. Um, they're sort of fundamental to the inverse scattering transform. It's a generic object that you see in all sorts of nonlinear PDs. Okay, so that's solitons. Um, so I told you about the nonlinear piece. Now let me tell you about the uh, linear piece, the system that we're going to describe. So I'm going to be talking about thallus pumps. Um, so a thallus pump is a kind of a one-dimensional version or a dimensionally reduced version of the quantum Hall effect. Um, you know, back in the early 80s when they were trying to figure out the origin of, a, of quantization of transport, um, David Thales came up with this model of a, a, a one-dimensional system that was being modulated periodically in time, adiabatically. Um, and he showed that electrons were transported in a quantized way uh, you know, fixed number of electrons, which is equal to this churn number, actually, were being transported through one cycle of the pump. Uh, so the analog here, since it's a one plus one dimensional system, is this, this screw pump here where you, you turn the crank and uh, you're bringing a fixed number of, um, you know, molecules, water molecules from the river up to the bank. And um, in, e in each turn of the crank, you bring a fixed number. And that's kind of like a thallus pump because this is 
one dimensionally periodic in space and also one dimensionally and periodic in time. Right, so this is sort of a picture of the ballast pump. It's a one plus one dimensional system, one space, one time. He showed that you had quantized motion, and it turns out that this is mappable directly to uh, churn insulator that I was talking about in the first part of the talk. Um, as he pointed out, um, you really have to have filled bands to make this work. You have to be living in the in the band gap, or else it, it doesn't work. You have to populate with with your electrons all the way up to the top of the band. Um, so to relate the notion of a thallus pump back to our 2D um, Hall effect, it can be described in the following way. So here's our box of electrons, 2D electrons, uh, magnetic field out of the screen. We've got some electric field because we, we put on a voltage in the vertical direction. Um, you can show that for, from the semi-classical equations, the motion gets what's called an anomalous velocity. So the velocity term that points to the, to the right. Um, and so here's like a, a unit cell, a, a, a strip unit cell from our solid. So each little dot here is meant to represent an atom. Um, and then this is sort of arrayed periodically in the vertical direction. So we've got a one dimensional system here, but there's an electric field that, that's turned on. So since you have this electric field, electric field is a force, which is a rate of change of momentum. So what you're doing is um, you're sweeping the momentum, the quasi moment, the block momentum in the, um, Brion zone that's pointing in the vertical direction, right? So this, you think of this as a unit cell, the electric field is sort of sending you through the Brion zone of the unit cell. So what this is, it is a one dimensional model, which is parameterized by that momentum. And that momentum is like that, the time dimension in the thallus pump. So by sweeping through momentum, you're doing this adiabatic process where you sweep through time. And what happens to the electron cloud as thallus showed uh, is that it, moves over while you do this, and it moves over by precisely the churn number. Again, you have to be in the gap for this to work. You have to populate, equally populate bands. Okay, so now before I, I so I'm gonna tell you how we realize this experimentally. I have to tell you a little bit about the fabrication technique. So we use laser written waveguide arrays. What does that mean? We have a piece of glass. We come in with our ultra fast laser and we focus it down to a point in the glass, and that locally permanently increases the refractive index of the glass at the focal spot. So it increases it by 10 to the minus three, roughly. Very similar parameters to an optical fiber. So if you're familiar with optical fibers, you're gonna, you're gonna probably understand this. Then what you do is you just drag the glass along so that the, um, the region of increased refractive index becomes like a tube, and that's a waveguide. Right? You just, and then you just keep doing this again and again and again. You can make these arbitrary patterns in three dimensions. Actually, I'm only going to need two in this case, but you can do these crazy patterns. That's how we did the, uh, what we call the Fusili waveguides to get the churn insulator. Uh, and then you can make the waveguides closer together or farther apart. If they're close together, then there's some evanescent tunneling between the modes. And so you can have hopping from one to the next. So this is actually described. You, of course, you use Maxwell's equations to describe this, but you could show that um, in the regime in which the laser is largely propagating forward, which it is, um, you actually get a uh, Schrodinger equation which describes this as very standard in optics. Um, so it's described by a Schrodinger equation, but where the, the, the coordinate along the waveguide axis is um, like a time coordinate. So instead of being I D D T psi, in, as in the Schrodinger equation, it's I D D Z psi. So this is something that carry you know, would use all the time. Um, it, and it, it perfectly described the laser beam. You shoot a laser beam, it's diffracting. The diffraction dynamics as a function of Z is governed by the Schrodinger equation. That's what's going on in these waveguides. So if you make a 2D array, then you have like an artificial two-dimensional material in which you can observe the dynamics of what's going on. And this is just an experimentally extracted um, hopping constant between the waveguides. They're evanescent popping so that it's exponentially dropping off as a function of the distance between wave beds. And so you can create these arbitrary patterns. So here you can see the fabrication process happening. There's the chip down there. It looks like a microscope slide. Uh, there's a little objective lens. The beam is just sort of focusing down through the objective into the chip. And this is sort of real time. So, um, you know, creating a few hundred of these will take, you know, less than an hour. 
So this is this is a you know one of our standard techniques. Okay, so what's the thallus pump? The thallus pump is um, a lattice, one-dimensional lattice. Again, it's, it's one-dimensional, but it's being modulated in time. But for us, time is Z. Okay, so instead of actually anything changing in time, it's actually just being modulated like this. So the waveguides are coming closer and farther apart from one another as a function of Z, which is the axis, the, the waveguide axis. So it, so it looks like this, right? And it's this whole lattice that just keeps going out really far. Okay, um, and so it's a three-site model. As I said, it's an Aubrey Andre model. You can show that it's a thallus pump, and it corresponds to a churn insulator in two D, and it has these churn numbers here. So, bottom band is churn minus one, the middle band is churn plus two, and then the top band is again churn minus one. And you can see these chiral edge states that show you that indeed it's a it is a churn insulator. So that's the model that we start with, three-site Aubrey-Andre model. Okay, so what we do uh, first is we start with a linear regime, um, non-interacting. We inject a Wani function. Wani function is a function that equally populates all states in a band. And by starting out with a Wani function, so it's a localized function, but it's kind of the bosonic analog of um, equal filling. So we, we populate this one function. Of course, one function is not an eigenstate, so it's going to spread out as a function of z, and that's what you're seeing here. So it spreads out, but it's, it actually stays a one function the whole time. And what that means, actually, is that um, it's going to move over by the churn number. So if you take its center of mass and look at as a function of z, of this propagation coordinate, it is moving over to the left by one unit cell through each one cycle of the pump. And why is it moving by one? The reason is that the churn number is minus one. So it's moving to the left by one on average. It's a one function. If we didn't populate it equally, if it weren't a one function, then it wouldn't do that. It would do something else. Okay, so now what we do is we look for solitons. Okay, so we turn, now the interactions turn on. We look at the solitons that propagate through this thing. And this is numerics. What we see is that the solitons are quantized as well, and they're quantized precisely to the churn number. And that's not obvious at all because a soliton just has some population in the band. So Thales insisted that you have to have this equal population of every state in the band, but this is not an equal population, and yet it's sharply quantized. Um, the reason for that, for the quantization, uh, we uh, figured out in retrospect is that actually there's only at in the low power regime there's only one soliton per band. So if you believe in nonlinear adiabaticity, if you believe that the adiabatic theorem applies to nonlinear systems, gross potassium equation, which is well justified, then it ha the soliton has to come back to itself or itself shifted by some integer number of unit cells. Um, so that's the origin of the quantization. Why is it the churn number? That's not obvious. Uh, we have we eventually found a proof that shows that indeed uh, it uh, it is quantized to the churn number. So we know it's an integer. But we could show only for weak nonlinearity for weak interactions, um, it is uh, precisely quantized to the churn number. We could not generalize that to strong interactions, stronger interactions, and I'll I'll explain why. Uh, I'll explain the consequences of that in a second. What we see is for very strong um, interactions in the mean field sense still, you're perfectly trapped. Uh, you don't move at all. That makes sense because now you're generating a very deep potential well and you're just trapped in that potential well. You can't move. Okay, so if you have this sharp transition from being perfectly integer pumped to being totally trapped. Okay. And again, this is not a one year function. So it, you know, if we were to turn off the interactions, there would be no quantization for this wave pattern. So let me explain what's going on in the pumping to the trapping process. So um, here you're seeing the trajectory of the soliton. So it starts out in site A and it moves over to site A here, but in, in uh, the next unit cell over to the left. What you're seeing here is at these two points, you have these nonlinear bifurcation diagrams of new modes that can emerge in the lattice 
as a function of increasing power. So in general, nonlinear system, in a linear system, if you have three sites, then you're gonna have three states, right, per, per unit cell. Nonlinear system, that's absolutely not true. You could get more and they just appear and you have no idea where they're gonna appear. And these are examples of these nonlinear states that just appear. So I'm gonna ramp up the interaction strength ramp up the nonlinearity. And what you see is that um, new states will emerge in this trajectory. So you have this sharp integer quantization, but now you have this other, these other states that just pop out. And you can see there's a transition that happens where it goes now from A to the same A down here. But the point is it was quantized the whole time. So it's always an integer that integer goes from being minus one to zero sharply. Okay, so here's experimental results. Um, so this is looking at the end of the chip. So after it's been evolved for a certain uh, uh, time. Um, so here's just a linear dynamics, low interaction strength. Okay, it's just kind of spreading out haphazardly. So this is, sorry, this is going through one third of the pump, two thirds of the pump, and then the full pump. So here you see a soliton form. So it's, it becomes much more strongly localized, uh, but moves over by one site, one third of the unit cell, and then eventually becomes trapped. Here, uh, now it's, we're pumping by two thirds. Here it kind of spreads out. We see this soliton form, and then eventually it gets trapped. And then similarly here for a full unit cell. So it spreads out, soliton forms, you have this cell focusing, and eventually it gets, it gets trapped. And that's uh, confirmed in the numerics as well. Um, so we see this, um, this transition, this transition from being moving over by um, the fixed quantized amount back uh, to being trapped. We thought maybe this was a feature of the particular band that we were using or the particular model. So we tried a whole bunch of different models, a bunch of different bands, um, and we could show that indeed that the solitons were um, sharply quantized in each case. So we saw, for example, in this middle band with churn two, we saw that it moves over to the right by two unit cells. For the corresponding soliton. So we uh, triple checked that it's a general phenomenon. This is a kind of dramatic demonstration. This is numerics. Um, uh, here we just sweep some linear parameter in the Hamiltonian, so just some hopping, um, and we see the topological phase transition happen. So these are the bands of the model, um, and uh, you can see the soliton trajectories here. So starting out here and it's ending there, so it's ending in the same place. And this is this um, churn number minus one. But then we sweep through a hopping and we're gonna have a phase transition when the bands touch, churn number can change and uh, turns out you go to churn plus two for the relevant band. And then here's the soliton uh, over here on the left. So now I'm gonna let it run. So you can see that as the hoppings change, the quantization is sharp. Nothing's changing in terms of where it ends up in the path. But of course the path is getting distorted. Um, but then, boom, you have this sharp transition um, as soon as the bands touched over here. So the bands touched, sharp uh, change. So this, this really shows you that it's quantized. <clears throat> um, okay, and we can, what, we can, what we eventually showed theoretically was that um, indeed the solitons follow the Wanye function of the band from which they bifurcate in the weakly interacting machine. Um, so that shows you that the solitons are quantized to the churn number. Okay, now the fractional case. So this is, this is, uh, was more of a surprise to us. Okay, so same system, more or less, but in this case, we're using, instead of a three site model, we're using a five site model. So we have a five site Aubrey Andre, the hoppings are um, being modulated as a function of time. This is what it looks like. The periodicity is now five unit cells. Okay, uh, if we look at the band structure here, we have the bottom band is churn plus two. The next band, which is very close in energy is churn minus three. And then there's a bunch of others, okay? What we see are these two solitons that are below the bottom band. These are like two, you know, in points, quote unquote, degenerate ground states, solitons are ground states. Um, so there's two of them here and they're kind of weaving around each other. Um, it's very atypical. 
Um, but so there, there are two of them. This You really do need finite power to have more than one. Uh, so we're away now from the low power regime. And here's what we see in the experiment. Um, so left is experiment, right is simulation. So what you see is um, you launch the soliton, okay? In the linear regime down here, it just diffracts as usual, so it spreads out. Um, but once you get to sufficient interaction strength, what you can see is the soliton forms and it moves over to the left by one unit cell, but it moves through two cycles of the pump. So it takes two cycles of the pump, two cycles of the thallus pump to move over by one unit cell. So on average, it's moving one half of a unit cell per cycle of the pump. So that's the sense in which I mean it's fractional. It's fractional motion of the sun. And again, this, this can't happen rigorously. This cannot happen at weak interactions. You need these sort of moderate interactions for this to actually happen. And it happens through nonlinear bifurcation. So here's the um, a little animation of exactly the same thing. So again, left is experiment, right is simulation. Um, and here you can, you, as I ramp up the power, the interaction strength, the soliton is gonna form. <clears throat> so it's, it's getting focused. So this is like the laser beam going through the focusing medium. It's focusing down. It's not diffracting anymore. And it's moving over by, you can see from site 35 to site 30. So by five unit cells um, over the course or 31, um, over the course of two cycles. See, 10 fifths. So it's, it's moving over through, through two cycles of the pump. It's moving over by one unit cell. So again, fractional. So the question is, what is what exactly is going on here? Why is it fractional? Um, well, first I'll point out, um, so we tried a 13 site model. In the 13 site model, um, there's all sorts of different fractions that just pop out. They just emerge. So we get a, a minus eight. So it's gotta be an integer in the low power regime. And then we get a minus three halves and then a minus one fifth. This is obviously evocative of fractional quantum hall. But again, this is not a many body state that we're talking about. This is a mean field state. So it's not the fractional quantum hall. So why? Okay, so um, what's happening to the 1A functions in the, in the integer case? So let's go back to the integer case for a second. Um, the 1A functions, so this is, this is a turn one system, turn one. The 1A functions move over by precisely one unit cell over one cycle of the pump. So this is one cycle of the pump at the top. So it moves over by one um, unit cell. Uh, in other words, because it's turn one, if you were to take a vertical line here, the electron would pass it once, you're pumping exactly one electron um, through one cycle of the pump. But at moderate power, now you're gonna have different bands talking to one another. So maybe the natural object to use is not the one function of a single band, but rather the one function of multiple bands. So maybe the one function of two bands, the multi-band one functions corresponding to those two bands. So when you incorporate the other band, you have two one functions. So simplest case, the sum of the churn numbers in the two bands is still one, but it's still two bands involved. And so there's gotta be two 1A functions. So what's happening is this 1A function is pumping over here. So it's exactly where this one would be. So it's the same as this one now. And this one's pumping over there. So it's still the case corresponding to churn one that there's one electron that's passing any vertical slice here. So this is still a churn one system but one electron is being pumped. In the electronic case, you would just, you would populate the two of them, right? Together, because you're populating these two bands, right? Fermi, Fermi level is above the second band, right? But in optics, you, you only populate one of them with the soliton. So this one here, for example, you start here and you end up in a different state by the end of the thallus pump. It takes another cycle of the pump 
to go the full integer. Right? So it takes two cycles to get back um, to that same state, but shifted over by the turn number. So this suggests that the formula for those fractions is just you take the relevant bands that are involved, you add up their churn numbers, and you divide by the number of bands. So the case we had was churn two and churn minus three. Right? So you add them up, that's minus one. Divided by two, there's two bands involved, that's minus a half. And that's what we see in the experiment is that remember it moved over by one unit cell to the left over the course of two cycles of the pump. And that's what's happening here. So this is a low power regime. We see that it moves over um, by an integer. So it's turn two, so it moves over by two unit cells over two uh, per cycle of the pump. Whereas in the fractional case, it moves to the left by one churn, the churn number one by one unit cell through two cycles. And we see that it maps very closely to these multiband uh, winding functions. And then we can really understand this trapping even more generally. So as I said, when you go to the really high power regime, so the mean field interactions are much stronger than the hopping, then you get this strong confinement, very, very strong confinement. Well, we can now understand that as um, incorporating not just two bands, but now all the bands. So what's the sum of the churn numbers of all the bands? Zero, because all the churn numbers have to add up to zero. And so displacement is zero, quantized is zero. So it's really, we can understand, we fully understand the weak interacting regime, moderate and strong. Okay, again, strong in the mean field sense, right? So if you're a uh, cold atoms person, it's not, it's not U over J that's strong, it's U psi squared over J, U times the power over J. Okay. Um, thought I'd say a few things about other stuff if I have time going on in my group. Um, so just a little add. Um, do I have a few seconds? A little? Yeah, I probably have a few seconds. Okay. Um, a few minutes. A few minutes. Even okay. Okay. Um, so, so this, I, I'm kind of, I really like this one. So it's, um, so if, if you guys are familiar in the graphene literature, um, this is 10 or 15 years ago, the, the Manchester graphene guys, at least some of them showed that, um, that if you take a piece of graphene and you, you strain it in homogeneously, so you, like you, you take a square sheet of graphene, you yank it up on the sides, pull it down the middle, then um, around the Dirac cones, you get a, an effective magnetic field. So Mike Cromie used this with graphene bubbles to realize this artificial magnetic field of 300 Tesla. So we saw Lando levels corresponding to a 300 Tesla magnetic field. Um, and of course, not a real magnetic field, but kind of impressive that you get, you know, 300 Tesla. So I thought, okay, well, you know, in photonics, magnetic interactions are very, very weak. Um, and uh, we normally can't get magnetic effects at all. Uh, but we can strain a photonic crystal. And so we can get these pseudo magnetic effects. Um, and so actually a bunch of people have done this. So I had this idea like 10 years ago, we tried it in waveguides, but it's been limited to small systems. No one's ever been able to resolve Lando levels for this. So with photonic crystals, you can go to uh, large, large system size for us, which is about a million sites. Um, and so we took a photonic crystal. You can see it here. This is the roughly the unit cell. Um, it has a Dirac cone in the spectrum. So it's just like graphene, except photonic. And then we strained it and we, look at the, we looked at the spectrum. And we strain exactly the right way to get the Lando gauge. Um, and then you see it goes from having a Dirac cone. We have a tiny little gap because of fabrication imperfections. And boom, you see Lando levels in the spectrum as soon as you strain. It's really, they just pop up. Really kind of cool. And then we're also working with 3D photonic crystals. Um, and we can see, um, we can see wild points. Uh, and so we, um, in these 3D photonic crystals, and We've got wild points that are charge two, and we can sort of play with them and split them up and make them uh, make a charge two wild point into two charge ones and actually see the splitting and so on. So we fabricate these three D photonic crystals with um, two photon polymerization, uh, and there's there's a way of getting this what are called chiral Lando levels in three D photonic crystals. So we might, might try that at that point at, at some point. 
Okay, so with that, I think I'll stop here and uh, thanks very much for your attention. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the last slide you showed? Yeah. Um, so exactly what quantity did you measure to observe the, the pseudo magnitude? Right, okay. So um, we have a photonic crystal. Um, it's a planar structure. It's in, in silicon, a silicon slab. Um, and it's very straightforward, actually. So um, we fabricate it in a way, standard silicon fabrication, E-beam plus etching. Um, so we have this thing. You shoot in light um, from a telecom laser, a tunable telecom laser, focus it down, collect the light with the same objective, look in the Fourier plane, in the Fourier plane, you see the Fourier transform of the modes. Um, and so you see isofrequency contours associated with, the, with um, whatever bands you happen to get. Uh, and then you sweep the wavelength, and that's basically what you're seeing when I show this. I said just reflection spectroscopy. Very, very straightforward. I can follow on <laughs> again for your future work. It's very interesting. So um, when you have these different bands, yeah. um, so in principle, then you can look at optical transitions or something. Mm -hmm. you do that? Yes, I mean they Some these are bands. right there, but they're they're photonic bands, so it's it's optical transitions in a different sense. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so in actually a very similar sense to how Carey uh, looks at generating supercontinua. So, or, or a frequency comb. So you would populate, you'd come in with an ultra fast laser and populate one of them. And then you'd start to see the other ones populate um, as a function of increasing power um, and through four-way mixing. Are you going to do something like that? Definitely. Yeah. I, I just submitted a proposal for the laser. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, it's more expensive than I thought actually. I think I follow up on what uh, I feel like the Turn edges yeah. in order to get the slower, yeah. Uh, um, in order to get the slower light yeah. from the edge, yeah. Uh, rather than couple of these, so, so um, it's like if you couple multi layers, right? German, but with oppositely going turn numbers or something like that, huh. you can also could you also get kind of like an average slower light. I think what would happen in that case is so say you take two of them and they have opposite churn numbers, right? Then you'd have counter propagating edge states. No reason they wouldn't gap, churn, churn zero overall. It's a gap system. And then it's more or less like any like, other. Yeah, so it's, it's probably like having an odd number. I know, no, right. An odd number. Um, yeah, then you'd have not. You'd have not. Say again. I was wondering whether that would be that kind of slow light because of physics similar to the Talus pump that you're presenting. Um, I think it would be in the end, it would be a way of manipulating the dispersion, right? So it, you would you would change the dispersion of the edge states that way, and so you you can manipulate it. But there's easier ways. Like what we do is kind of send the gap effectively to zero as we approach the edge. Right, so it's sort of if you think of a local gap as a function of space, send it to zero slowly in a smart way that's sort of highly optimized, then you can get these dispersion lists. If you just put a bunch on top of each other, they're, it's going to be like this, and you have yeah, yeah. You have backscattering. 